That's it, yeah. Yep. Um, these are new reading glasses I need. I have macular degeneration. And so that uh, makes things more complicated. Uh, it's very difficult um, to uh, figure out where to begin, you know. I was invited here, and I do thank you folks for inviting me, you, the church. Um, uh, and I could begin with Adam and Eve. <laughs> I could begin with Abraham. That's all a bit too early. Uh, Anti-Semitism uh, comes into the picture, in the historical picture, a bit later, <laughs> of course, uh, about um, uh, in the second or third century of, of the Common Era. And I do want to begin there, really, and uh, read to you uh, some of the things which you probably have never heard. Have you ever, who here, I'd like to really know, has ever heard from the church fathers. I don't see any hands coming up. Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> one person. And the church fathers are really, in, in my opinion, and in other people's scholars' opinions, the, where really anti-Semitism begins. Now, I could spend here the next hour and just talk about the church fathers. I don't plan to do that. But I bought a book written by a, by a, um, a person that uh, was my colleague. Her name is Rosemary Ruther. Your pastor probably has heard about her. She, I think, was a Methodist minister, if I'm not mistaken. And she and I were on the same faculty in Washington, D.C., teaching there. And uh, she wrote this book, which is called Faith and Fratricide. And fratricide means killing of brothers of, or, and sisters. And uh, so uh, th this is an rem absolutely remarkable book. And uh, if you're interested in the subject and to learn more about it, I would suggest that you really get this book. Uh, so let me read to you just from one of the church fathers, a, a very important one. And um, you can then make your own judgment on what this sounds like. He writes, he's by the way a person from the uh, fourth century of the common era, uh, 300 something, 350 roughly. When, and this is part of a sermon I, that, that needs to be remembered. When animals have been fattened by having all they want to eat, they get stubborn and hard to manage. Another prophet uh, animates the same thing when he says Israel ran about madly like a heifer stung by a gadfly, and still another called her an untrained calf. When animals are unfit for work, they are marked for slaughter. And this is the very thing which the Jews have experienced. By making themselves unfit for work, they have become ready for slaughter. How does that make you feel coming in a sermon, a Christian sermon? Now this book is full of texts, brief texts, longer texts uh, that you may find in here. It's well researched and most of the, um, the, the, uh, the texts that are in here uh, are from Latin or Greek source, sources, uh, which in those days was the language of the clergy, you know. And so um, you get an idea how, how Jews were thought of in those days. Now, in Germany, I'm not going to s s stay there very long, but I did bring uh, for you to see an original copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf means my struggle. And let me just tell you a little bit why I brought this. In 
pre-Hitler times in Germany when a couple was married in a church and most of the people in Germany at that time were, Rome, were Lutherans with a smaller group of Roman Catholics. Um, when a couple uh, was married in the church, they received a gift. And that's still done, I think, in churches and certainly done in synagogues too. We give people, young people, who uh, have a bar mitzvah, you know what a bar mitzvah is probably, a bat mitzvah for girls, um, get a gift. Uh, and uh, when Hitler came to power now, all this was changed. What was given to a couple being married in the church was Mein Kampf. And you, 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 by the way, are free to look at these books later on if you'd like to. Uh, be careful with them because the pages of some of these books are getting a little uh, sensitive. So instead of Jesus Christ, you get Hitler, okay? And then there's a dedication here, of course, uh, which, which tells you, uh, where in the world is this? Uh, that where, where and when this was done. But you can look at it yourself. The dedication is right here. It was in the city of Hanover, where a young couple by the name of Kaiser were married and received this book. When we came back, my family from the concentration camps, our, uh, our department was completely ruined. Uh, the, the SS had in that uh, apartment the headquarters. It was a beautiful apartment. And uh, so the local government uh, assigned to us a small, different apartment. We were five people, and the new apartment had one bedroom. <laughs> and uh, we were five people. So my sister and my cousin uh, stayed in one of, in, was actually stayed in the living room with a couch that was made into beds. And, um, I stayed with my parents in the bedroom. And on the shelf of that apartment, which had been cleaned out of the Nazis, they were shipped back to Germany, I found this particular book. So it must have been a family by the name of Kaiser that lived in that apartment. And uh, as we visited, um, my former wife and I, the first time after I had left and come to the United States, uh, I saw this and uh, I appropriated this book for myself. And the other book that I found there, which you are welcome to inspect, is there anyone here who knows some German? Oh, good. Pardon me? You were born. Excellent. So you, you can read this yourself. The, 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 uh, the Judenfrage, which means the Jewish question. I'm not sure why it was a question. They made a question of persecuting Jewish people, and not just Jewish people, but their own people too, who had professorial uh, educations and medical doctors and ev anybody who didn't agree with Hitler ended up in concentration camps to make this simple. I mean, there are exceptions to this, of course. But the Judenfrage, and then underneath it says, Stoff und Behandlung in der Schule which means material and treatment of this material in school. So th this is particularly uh, sensitive to, to handling, but feel free to look at it, and you may be interested in this. Um, so uh, it's sort of pitiful to see all this, uh, but I'm glad that I got this material because it always arouses interest and the people to whom I uh, speak and whom I teach. So, uh, what I want to tell you basically, Ruth has told you some of it already. My father was an attorney. <coughs> he had studied uh, law in Vienna, German background. And my mother too was from a family of German background, German Jewish, of course. And um, he was highly esteemed, and I, having had many, many teachers in my education, 
can tell you without hesitation that my father was the best teacher I ever had. He was a highly educated person. You could discuss with him politics, literature, music, <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> I, I had two uncles who were involved in chemistry, engineers, and he was able to discuss that kind of stuff with them too. So he was highly educated, as I said, and uh, while he was a lawyer, and um, we were middle class people, basically, uh, he was more interested in educating his daughter and me uh, after the, the law involved hours in his office when he came home, he spent with my sister and me. So when I was three years old, I learned chess from him, played chess with him. Um, I l learned how to play the violin. I didn't bring it because I knew you'd all <laughs> exit very quickly. Uh, <laughs> never became a great violinist. But in Jewish circles in those days, the sons were always studying violin and the daughters studying piano. I would have preferred to study piano, but that wasn't open to me. So uh, to make a long story short, uh, and my mother was what, the best cook, except for her mother, of course. <laughs> her grandmother was even that much better a cook than she. So <laughs> that's, that's my story, and I was a kid. Uh, and had a wonderful time with my parents for uh, 15 years. Uh, until, well, actually 14 years, because when I was 14, the other half of our town was in Poland. We were in the Czech, what is now the Czech Republic. Well, the Poles in 19, um, just one year before the war broke out, uh, took over our area, so we became Poles. You know, in Europe, this happens all the time. Uh, people change territory and uh, nationalities change, and suddenly I was in Polish school. And let me tell you, I, I understand Polish, I speak a bit of Polish, and uh, I value these people, certainly, who are doing an excellent job, by the way, right now, in getting the refugees from the Ukraine and, uh, and supporting them. Uh, but anti-Semitism in Poland was very strong. And when I started by force, uh, going to Polish schools, we had a miserable time, and that's true for my sister and my cousins. I had a lot of cousins there uh, who unfortunately didn't survive the Holocaust. But um, here I was in Polish school, and th the professors, the teachers made fun of us because we were not only Czechs and not Poles, but we were Jews. And so the humiliations that we went through were absolutely indescribable. You have to experience it to understand it. I mean, I can give you the words and tell you about it, but it's, it was miserable. So when the Nazis then came in, in 1939, it was like a liberation. Little did we know that what we were getting, going to get from the Nazis was even worse that, than the previous year under the very brief I think eight or nine months occupation of our area by Poland. Okay, we've got to go on here. Uh, the Nazis occupied us, as I said, on the first day of the war, on September 1st, 1939. And uh, this is when uh, our misery, I can call it misery, began. Uh, in the sense that we were Kicked out after, after kicked out of apartment after apartment, and after our loss of the first apartment, we didn't have much much left. We had no possessions left. My father had a library of about two thousand books. Uh, we had the beautiful place. Uh, all that was gone. Uh, we left that apartment with suitcases. Went to an uncle's apartment who had an apartment house there, uh, my uncle Oscar. Uh, we stayed there uh, with their three people in the same apartment for 
I don't know, um, maybe three or four months, then they were kicked out. And so it went on and on and on. And as you mentioned, we ended up in a ghetto. The ghetto was on the, on the border of the city and the countryside. It was an old, uh, uh, sort of messed up, uh, rotted out uh, uh, amusement, amusement place. In other words, there was a restaurant there that no longer functioned, of course, and there were dance halls there. there. And the, the thousand Jewish people of, that were still in our town of Czeski, Cieszyn, uh, and Cieszyn, the Polish side, uh, had to live in these dance halls. And my father, after the Nazis came in, because of his reputation, uh, was made the, the head of a Jewish council. And what was the Jewish council? It was an organization that represented the Jewish population that was still in town vis-a-vis -vis the Gestapo and the SS who ran basically the town. And so we were on the stage of, of, of one of the dance halls. I mean, these were big, big halls and the people strung wires ac across. I mean, you can see that probably supported in the middle. I don't remember the details. And then they hung sheets on these wires and created small compartments, 10 by 10 or 12 by 12. And the families lived there. And because my father was the representative of the Jewish community, we had the privilege of living on the stage with two other families on either side. So let me tell you how the, f how the shoe, the first shoe, dropped on me. Um, you know, children are children. Uh, we didn't understand the, the seriousness of the situation, really. And uh, so we tried to live a more or less normal life. Well, there were some old, it was an, just an old junky place. So we found some old doors, wooden doors, and we managed to make out of this ping pong tables. And we played ping pong on the doors. And the, somebody there cut out some paddles, you know. And so. so I had the wonderful, wonderful experience of me meeting a young woman who was uh, a bit actually older than I by one year. Her name was Lydia. And uh, we played ping pong. And she lost every game. <laughs> I was pretty good at it. Uh, she lost every game, but she laughed. And her laugh, I can only compare to the, to the sound of a silver goblet being hit by a little spoon. Sweet. That's all I can say. And I fell in love, of course. And fortunately, it was reciprocated, I want you to know. She loved me too. <laughs> so Lydia and Walter were together from then on, and we worked uh, in on various capacities uh, in forced labor, actually, that the Nazis imposed on us. And then the shoe dropped, because one evening, Lydia came to the stage and said, Valti? I was called Valti because I'm Walter, you know. So, an endearment. So I came to me and said, I've got bad news for you, for us. And I said, so what is it, Lydia? And she said, well, my parents decided to flee, to leave the ghetto uh, surreptitiously and to try to walk east through Poland toward what is now the Ukraine, which was then Poland. You see, these, city, these places just change uh, in Europe uh, and has been changing for, for centuries. So um, I was demolished. Uh, and so was she, and we embraced, and uh, she gave me a little, little thing, I don't know what you call it, on a, pardon? A pendant. a pendant on her gold chain, and said, Valti, Here's the gold chain. Whenever you look at it, you'll be thinking of me. And they left. And about five, 
to 10 days, I don't remember exactly, someone came to my father and said, I got bad news for you. We found a couple with their daughter dead. Uh, some German group, military group, intercepted them and shot them on the spot. And my Lydia was gone. And I cannot tell you what this did to me. Uh, I have that little pendant still in my pocket here, a cheap version of it, that a teacher uh, who I spoke month, years ago, one of the schools, and told them the story, came up to me afterwards and said, could this pendant that I described in that particular meeting been the same as what I found uh, on a market here somewhere? And I looked at me and said, and it was this cheap metal thing, whereas she uh, had given me one made from gold. And so if you're interested to see this, I have it here with me on my keychain. So that, that was something I will never forget. And Lydia is still in my thoughts to this day, uh, many, many, 40, it's not 40, what am I talking about? 80 years later or something like that. Uh, the ghetto situation was bad, needless to say. Uh, how do you live with one, roughly 1,000 people under these conditions with limited food? We also had to wear white armbands as Jews with a blue Star of David imprinted on it. And I still have at home, and I meant to bring it but forgot to bring it, the armband that my mother somehow uh, kept. I don't know how she managed to do it, but she embroidered the, the, the blue star. Did you see that, Ruth? Yeah. And why did she embroider it? Because the, originally, as it was handed out to us, it was printed. Well, when you get a printed something piece of cloth, it'll wear off and wear out. And that was against the law. We had to... Ha maintain the blue star, Nazis, okay? And so my mother, being excellent at doing needlework, also embroidered it in, the, in blue, with blue wool, or a bit with blue, and uh, I still have it. So that lasted roughly two years. We were in the ghetto, and uh, it was miserable, absolutely miserable. But, and Lydia was gone, so that, that was very, very sad. I kept that little emblem from her for a while, but eventually, of course, lost it because our clothing turned into rags after a while, working on very heavy projects like building roads for the Nazis, these German expressways that are being used to this day. Uh, and um, it must have gotten into my pocket, it went out, bingo. I had the gold, I don't know whether I know, whether I know this, I, had, I found one. Uh, it, it was a little yoke, by the way, I'm sorry, I, I get involved in this. And in, in this yoke, there was a little round piece of gold, that twist, that turned. And when you turned it quickly, it spelled out, I love you. And I found one like this in a store and gave it to Gail, my present wife. Uh, in June, um, 19, let's see, 1999, no, 1949, I'm talking about. Uh, we were told the night before to prepare one suitcase per person and would be taken down to the station and transferred. Well, that meant that we lo left the, uh, the ghetto and went down there guarded by SS uh, units with dogs that barked and tried to snap at our feet, at our ankles. It was a very scary moment for all of us. And we were separated from each other. Uh, you know, uh, I, I can't resist saying this, but when our past president 
started doing this for political reasons uh, to prevent uh, people uh, to, to come in here, refugees. Uh, at the southern borders, very often the, the, the uh, families were separated from each other. I, I really resented this and I would still resent it. That's about the worst thing you can do to a family, to take the children away. So having said this, let me continue. And then we waited for trains to come. Uh, we had to hand over all, all jewelry or anything we had, coins, gold coins, silver coins, and stuff like that, to the SS with, who were seated there behind tables. We passed by and handed over and these things over. I remember my father had given me an Omega pocket watch, a steel watch, I, which I was thrilled to get, of course. And I had this in my pocket, and the SS man says, hand over your valuables. And I could not get it over my mind to hand this over. I had waited for that steel watch for years, practically. And so I kept it and then was scared that I would be found out not to have handed it over. So uh, this happened to be a junkyard, by the way, where we assembled prior, prior to being put on trains. So I dug a, with my heel a hole in the ground in the middle of the junkyard and dropped the watch into the hole, thinking that it would survive. After the war, I'll come back. Why not? I get to a junkyard. I know I remember there was a piece of junk that I could have identified, and I'd get my watch. Well, it ain't work. It works, doesn't work out that way, unfortunately. <coughs> okay, trains came. The adults were uh, loaded on the trains, and uh, other trains came, and we young people were loaded on trains. I have to look on the watch. Oh, my gosh. I have till three o'clock, or how, how long do I have? I have no idea. As long as you want. Yeah, there's no time limit. There's no time limit? No. Can I run over 15 minutes? Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, condensed, you know. I'm an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> I have a long history. <laughs> and so uh, it's, it takes a while to, to get some highlights. So to, to make, uh, to, to shorten the story a little bit, we were loaded on the trains, all the youngsters in one train and then the older people on the others. Little did the older people know that that train was destined to go directly to Auschwitz. Have you heard the term Auschwitz, most of you? Well, you know what happened there. Um, a million and a half people were, were murdered in Auschwitz, uh, among them, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of children, and babies even. And these people had no idea. And among those people that were supposed to go to Auschwitz were my parents. And my father's sister sat next to him. And uh, it's, I mentioned to him that my father had been made, whether he wanted it or not, they had to head this assembly or this, this council of Jewish people. So he knew a, his boss, a Jewish man in the city of Sosnowitz, where the headquarters of the Jewish councils was. And um, so what happens, I mean, you know, I don't believe in miracles, I'll tell you right now. Uh, I don't have to excuse myself, but I just don't. But this seems like a miracle. And I, I'll just, I'm, scrolling this a little bit ahead in history. That, that train with the adults took off. There was one station between the city of Sosnovitz where his boss officially worked. And uh, when the train stopped in that one place, it so happened that the wagon, the train wagon, stopped in front of a group of SS people with that man, Jewish man, standing in the middle there. Not only did the train stop there, but the car in which my parents were stopped there. 
I mean, it's incredible. Mr. Marin, that was his name, looked into the car, saw my father, my sister, and, and um, my, my mother sitting there, and said to one of the SS men that stood next to them, get these two people out. Well, he, these, these people had been bribed, you know. He had a, a certain authority over these, over these men. To, I, I don't know how else to explain it. And so an SS man comes, and I learned all about this after the war, I want you to know, because I was the other train in the meantime. And as two, one SS man comes, tells my father and mother, you two, come out. He grabs the suitcase, pulls them out, puts them on the quay of, of the train, where the train had stopped. As soon as they touch the ground, the train takes off. Train went to Auschwitz. 24 to 38 hours later, all these people had been killed. But my father and my mother were saved. His sister went to Auschwitz. And uh, you know about the gas chambers. I cannot talk about that because I get, I, I just can't do it because it's such a humongous, incredible, disgusting, horrifying thing that I just can't talk about it. So that's where the people died. But my father, mother, and sister survived. Did you ever hear that story? No. no? I, I just hate it. Well, anyway. Uh, so I, we lost contact be between my parents and uh, the children. Com complete, con complete contact. Uh, our train took off, and it also went, to, well, it went to Sosnovitz, to the town, where uh, uh, we disembarked and uh, were put into a four-story high building called the Dulag, D-U-L-A-G, Durchgangslager in German, which means transitional camp, where most people who went into death started out and then were sent into various camps. And um, the unfortunate ones ended up in Auschwitz, of course. Uh, but in this particular case, this, our youth transport ended up there. And uh, we stayed there for two weeks. My father, as I said, ended up in Sosnovitz too, in a ghetto thanks to Mr. Marion who had taken him out of the train. And so uh, I was 15 years old at that point. I was scared to death without my parents. Uh, I, my bed in a big dormitory was on the second floor. And somehow uh, mail somehow arrived for people who were there. And in one of the mails that I got from my father said, he said, uh, why don't you on such and such a day get to the window and look out and we will be downstairs in the street. And uh, I did that and they appeared, my mother and uh, her, my mother and father and my sister who had been released for one reason or another, which I don't know. And I wanted to talk with them, but tried to talk from the second floor of the building. So I took a tiny little piece of paper, write, uh, wrote on, please help me to get out. It's all in German, of course. And threw it out of the window. And my father picked it up, he read it to my mom. I could see this from the window. And uh, he just looked undone. And he somehow with gestures, told me that he had tried, but he just couldn't do it. And so they were in the ghetto in Sosnovitz, and we were in the Dulag, D-U-L-A-G, and from there, within a few days later, we were sent to our first camp. So that's the beginning of the camp session, the camp air time that I spent there. That was three years. During those three years, I was transferred uh, seven times to different camps. Now people ask me, what, why were you transferred? 
I have no idea. I just was transferred. And transfer meant to get to, to, to be forced to get uh, onto a truck or into a train, and the train took off and uh, let us out at a particular camp. So there were, some people say six camps, some say seven camps. In some, in one of them I stayed only one week, so I don't count this. The first camp, uh, uh, Sakrau, now the names that I will give you are all German names, but they used to be Polish names. They were in occup German occupied Poland. And in Sakrau we built the Autobahn. The Autobahn were the expressways that Hitler built that are used to this day, of course, in improved conditions and widened and lengthened and what have you. And we were shoveling sand in, into, into, uh, into a uh, construction type train. And uh, my father always had taught me a good work ethics. If you do something, do it right. <laughs> well, in this particular case, uh, my fellow prisoners didn't appreciate it because I shoveled, I shoveled and I shoveled. And as the train was sitting there with all the different cars, my car was always filled first. And as that happened, I once found myself on the ground being beaten up by my fellow prisoners. Uh, there's nothing I could do about it. I mean, they just kicked me and hit my face and so forth and so on. So we marched then back to camp after having worked and I found one or two of these people and said, what in the world did you do? What have I done? Why did you beat me up? And he said, uh, they said, I don't know, one or two guys there, you have to get a bit smarter. When the guys, guards look, you shovel. When the guards don't look, you don't shovel. Do, do you really want to help Hitler to win the war by being so devoted to doing the kind of work? So I learned my lesson. And uh, that's probably partially to, to about that much of the whole misery that I lived through. That's perhaps that much of the reason why I survived. <laughs> the second camp was Brande, again a German name, and that was undoubtedly the worst camp I experienced, in, despite the fact that I had a privileged position. When we arrived in Brande, <coughs> it was Christmas 1940, it was the second camp. We marched through snow to get to the camp, and I saw tiny little lights in little tree, far away houses, it was Christmas time. And those were Christmas trees, undoubtedly. And uh, uh, we, uh, in better times, we had a maid who lived with us in our house prior to the war. Her name was Malchi Kurianova. She was a Hungarian lady. We loved her, we loved her. And so we as Jewish people had Christmas trees and we exchanged gifts on Christmas. We didn't do much with Hanukkah, Hanukkah which falls usually into Christmas time, which is a Jewish festival. So anyway, uh, Christmas music wafted through the air as we marched through the snow and arrived at the camp of Brande. Uh, I have a hard time talking about Brande because it was an extermination camp on a small scale. It wasn't like Auschwitz where 2,000 people were killed per hour, you know. No. Uh, the camp commander, a German uh, military person, he was not an SS person. Uh, he was part of a construction, German military construction unit uh, similar to the, to the American engineers, you know, uh, was a rabid anti-Semite. And he enjoyed killing people. And he enjoyed torturing people. And so 
uh, at a roll call in the morning, every morning was a roll call. There, there was no construction site. We did, didn't have to march out of the camp, but there was a roll call where we were counted. Did anybody flee during the, it was impossible to flee. But uh, there must have been maybe 800 to 1,000 people in that particular camp. So uh, during the roll call, uh, the first roll call, as we arrived, we had to give our name to a, a secretary there who was writing things down. And I, it came to me, I said, Walter Ziffer. And the Jewish camp commander, there was a camp commander, a prisoner camp commander inside the camp, and then there were German outside of the camp, who were the really people who directed the camp, punishments, et cetera, et cetera. So Mr. Pompey, who was the German camp commander, was standing there. He, he also heard my name. And Mr. Geburer, who was the Jewish camp commander, asked me the question. And I said, my name is Walter Ziffer. And the Jewish camp commander at this point said, oh, are you by any chance the son of Dr. Ziffer, the attorney from the city of Teshin, Chesky Teshin? And I said, yes. So he had me step out and he said, you're going to be my private servant. Now that was a tremendous thing that happened to me because I had access to food. He had under the table, and that's one of the first things that he showed me after I, I was shown my bed with all the, all the other guys. Then he called me and showed me his room. He had a separate room. Under the table was a big, big box, wooden box. And he opened, he, he wore black boots, just like the German SS people. So he just kicked open, kicked open the, the, the cover of the box. There were packages in there. They were all addressed to people in the camp, to prisoners. Well, <laughs> they didn't reach the prisoners because they were intercepted. They all ended up in that box. And we, privileged people, I was one of them, had access to the box. And Mr. Gebura said, mein, he called me mein Kleiner, my little one. Uh, you, you can come here and eat whatever you want to. So I have plenty to eat in that particular camp. But I had to follow him around like a puppy dog. Wherever he went, I had to walk with him. I didn't have a leash, but I better walk with him. So then he pointed, he opened a cupboard, and there were shelves in there. It was jams and bread and uh, cold cuts and stuff like that. And he said, now my Kleiner, don't I, do I, never, never, never do I want you to eat from those shelves. You can eat from the box, but you never touch that. Well, I, I didn't. So my job was to make a fire there about four or five o'clock in the morning and to clean his boots and to shine them. I mean, I mean shine them and uh, clean the room, etc., etc., and follow him around. Now, so what happened is this. There was a roll call every morning in the camp of Brandy where we stood lined up and uh, we practiced very often mützen auf, mützen up. You understand that. Um, we had these little blue, white uh, little hats. And so when the camp commander said, mützen up, you had to take it and slap it down like that. And it was like an orchestra, you know. And the person who was out of tune, out of, out of what? Uh, I don't know. Sync. Was out of sync, thank you. Uh, was punished later on, you know. So, I mean, this was orchestrated. And then Mützen auf, you know, and so forth and so on. But there was something else going on, too. And during, during these uh, roll calls, he walked through the, the, the people who were lined up and he'd come to you and slap. They all had whips, by the way, leather whips about that long. And he'll hit you on the head. You step out. You step out. And so he had a group of 10 to 12 people step out every morning. 
We were then let go. We did jobs in the camp, clean the sidewalks or you know, whatever, uh, prepare some of the food, uh, cleaning um, sh uh, sugar, what is the sugar, the stuff that grows, sugar, uh, like potatoes. You, know. you have to peel them for, this, for the kitchen. Okay. And uh, the other, these 10 people were marched off to the wash barracks. In the wash barrack, we didn't know what was going on, but these people never appeared again, interestingly. So I asked, after I noticed that, I asked one of the, in, one of the prisoners there, who had been there for quite a while, so what, what happens? And this guy just looked at me very sternly and walked away. Didn't say one thing. Well, at one point, uh, as I was digging a hole to, pu to put some piece of two by four into the ground for a fence, uh, an SS person came with another young person, a prisoner, and said to me, follow, follow us. And so he took us to the wash, to the wash barrack and what I saw defies description. It makes me sick to talk about it, but I, it needs to be mentioned. There were corpses lying in that wash barrack. One there, one there, one there, in totally deformed positions. And um, I just couldn't understand. They were lying there in excrement and in urine and in filth in all these weird positions. And uh, this young man, this other prisoner and I had the job of taking these corpses, putting them on a two-wheeled cart and carting them into the adjoining woods, the Fürstenwald, as it was called, and dumping them into a mass grave. Uh, now that I had seen that, I now had access, so, so to speak, to other prisoners who seemingly knew what was going on there. And what was going on there was this. There were, in these wash barracks, there were vats, big vats with boiling water, where the prisoners cleansed, cooked, boiled the underwear of the, pr of the guards. Uh, that there may have been like 50 guards there. I, I don't know how many guards were there. But just to explain to you that my mother did the same thing with our family too. Our underwear was boiled. But there it was done in these big vats that was ho holding hot water. And then there were, of course, showers. And the showers were always cold water. And so what was happening is that the prisoners that were chosen, as it were, were given, the cold water was running, they were forced underneath, naked, of course, and then there were guards and capos, which means camp police prisoners, who had boiling water in, in some pots or pans or whatever, and these people who had just been cold showered where, uh, what should, would I say? Sometimes my words just won't come. The, the, the hot water was poured over those people. And they, of course, were trying to avoid this, running around. And as they were running around, they were hit with their whips and with all kind of other implements until they died. And Mr. Pompey, the head of the camp, was watching this and enjoying it. I mean, it's just, you know, it's hard to believe, but it, it happened. And so I uh, was privileged there. But there's one other thing that happened. There was a German, a, a Jewish scribe, a prisoner scribe there, who knew of what was going on. Uh, the camp outside, as I found out later on, was because there was no construction site, was considered to be 
a camp where tired prisoners would be sent to to get a rest. Well, it wasn't so. They were being killed. And so this uh, the scribe in the office, a Jewish man, knew this and tried to smuggle out a letter telling the people who were still in the ghettos outside what was going in, on in this particular camp. And the letter that was taken out by somebody, I don't know who, uh, was intercepted. So here comes the sequel to what I just told you. I work on a fence uh, around the camp and I heard the radio calling me to come to the, um, to the hall where we were eating. And so of course I dropped everything and I go there. As I arrive, Mr. Gebura, the Jewish camp commander is already there and there were some capos, these camp policemen there, two or three of them. I arrive and Mr. Gebura said, just stand here. The door opens, Mr. Pompe, the German commander comes in and with him, the guards, comes this Jewish fellow, the scribe, who had written the letter that was intercepted. He is put into the, into the middle of the group, and this is just a continuing nightmare that I have. And Mr. Pompe walks up to him uh, and says to him, did you write this letter? And uh, the Jewish fellow says, yes. It was a short guy, very myopic, thick glasses, thick wind, thick, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, as he says yes, they started hitting him with their whips. I mean, th these were stiff leather whips and beating him. And I stand there. I'm, I have to watch this because I'm the puppy. And um, the, the, the man, what I remember best and still hear it sometimes is how his glasses are just knocked off by Mr. Pompey and he stepped on them. And the sound of the glass breaking has somehow penetrated my head. It's there, constant, when, when, whenever. And uh, they beat the man to death. He, he became literally just a pile of bloody stuff. And at that point, he's taken up by some couples. He's taken out of the, the room and he's dropped into the coal bin under the wash barrack. We are let go. And we hear this man uttering some screams during the night that followed until the next morning. And those screams were not human screams. They, I, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. Um, it was absolutely sickening. So that was the camp to which tired people were sent in order to recuperate. And a Holungslager, this is what it was called. Can you understand that? A holung, you don't understand, okay. So that was, I was finally transferred and went through a number of other camps. Uh, let me describe you one other one. That was Graditz, G-R-A, umlaut A, D-I-T-Z, which was a, a, a Luftwaffe, which was an Air Force installation. And there we moved furniture and machinery and that was a good camp because I don't know whether any one of you ha has ever been on an American uh, Air Force camp. I was close to Dayton, Ohio. And um, uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base is there. So it's a city, basically. And so we pushed these machinery through the streets, but what was in the streets was so wonderful trash cans, and that, that there were no OSS people there. These were 
These were Air Force people, Germans, that weren't interested in beating, uh, beating up on us. They wanted the work done. They were fairly decent. And so they allowed us to go through the trash cans. And the trash cans were filled with, well, what the trash cans are filled with. There was food, to some extent, that had been discarded. And uh, <coughs> sandwiches, half eaten, fruit, half eaten. The bread on some sandwiches, I'm telling you the truth, was turning green. That's how it happens if you haven't looked in your trash cans after a while and the stuff is sitting there. We ate all that and didn't get sick. Absolutely crazy. But, uh, well, it, it was one of the better camps. Uh, I worked on, you name it, laying bricks, laying cement blocks, uh, digging ditches, uh, picking holes in the ground, putting two by fours in. I mean, anything you can imagine happened. And I want to tell you, I'm, I'm not going to go into all this stuff. There's no point in it. But the last camp was Waldenburg, uh, an interesting camp. We marched every day through the city to the construction site, which uh, where a huge, um, where, where huge uh, installation of the German company EG Farben Industry was. It was an, as big a, a huge outfit as General Motors used to be, or as uh, some other huge American companies used uh, used to be. And uh, there, we were. Our job was, since they wanted to expand, to take an, uh, to to work on an adjoining area of of Earth, and to lower the level on it. And so we were digging holes by hand, and I'll tell you how that was done in a second, uh, into which was placed dynamite. We were evacuated, and then these the dynamites were exploded and exposed a new layer of ground that was then dug up by us, by us again. Uh, that was Waldenburg. Well, we marched through the city and we were a bunch of skeletons. We, I, I think if I say that we were no longer human beings and what we put behind that term, what, what is a human being? I guess we are. We didn't look as we look here, quite apart from the clothing. Um, at one point, as we marched through the city early in the morning, a person emerged on the sidewalk from behind the church and threw a package into our ranks. And I happened to catch that package. It was just a small thing. Immediately, there were hands all over this package trying to rip it open. And this was a sandwich, basically, a good-sized sandwich. German breads were big, you know, round. And uh, I didn't have a chance, really, other than keeping one little piece, one bite for myself because the other stuff disappeared. And shots rang out. And we kept on marching, and we went to the construction site, dug these holes, and by the way, these were about seven foot long steel rods. Uh, I stood opposite another prisoner. We held the steel rod like this. We lifted it about one foot. We let it drop. And it was all rock, okay? And then lifted it, turned it a little bit, let it drop, turned it a little drop, until a hole about that big was dug, and then the Germans evacuated us, put the dynamite in, boom, everything exploded, and then we were put, put back in to do this. So anyway, uh, we, I, I 
got, got this package, the shots rang out, and it was bitter cold. I don't know what the temperature was. It's very, very cold. And um, uh, marched them back. <laughs> On the way back, we always saw dead bodies lying in the snow who had been shot on the way to the work, who couldn't keep up with the marching, for instance. You know, we were skeletons. Uh, when, we, when I was liberated, I weighed, uh, I think, 79 pounds or something like that. I, I, I was bones just covered with skin. Um, I'll come back to the liberation in a moment. So, so anyway, I, I got this. I got to, to the camp. And uh, the evening came after we got our little bit of ration, bread, bread to eat. Took my shoes off and I saw that there was something wrong with the shoes. Uh, shoes were wooden soles with cloth tops and uh, shoelaces, of course. And um, one side, on, on the right side of my foot, the shoe was damaged. Well, I pulled off the shoe, didn't particularly hurt. And we had no socks, they're just square pieces of cloth. And uh, there was not a hole, but a partial hole on the outside of my foot. Just on the edge, uh, something hit me. And it must have been a bullet. Uh, and some kind of a white, pinkish, liquid was there, blood mixed with something else. Um, I didn't pay attention to it. Went back to my straw back, the uh, straw bed, lay down, slept, went to work the next day. Unfortunately, after one or two days, I could no longer put my foot into my shoe and uh, my, my foot had turned so purplish, greenish, and I knew that, that I had to do something about it. So there was a medical office on, in the camp manned by two uh, Dutch doctors, prisoners of course, who didn't have much stuff there as a medical office should have. Uh, they had uh, scalpels, they had aspirin, <laughs> their bandages, that's probably it. And so the doctor looked at me and said, that is bad, we have to do something about this. So he cleansed my wound. I mean, I, at that point I felt it, I wanted to go through the roof. And alcohol they had, and that of course made it worse to clean my wound. And then I crawled up into my sleeping quarter on the straw, I went to sleep. But the following day it was even worse. And so the doctor said, you, you cannot go back there. There was an adjoining room for people who had difficulties, who were very sick. So they put me under the structure. These were three layers of beds, like bunk beds out of wood with straw. And so he put me on the floor and the, 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 the covers for the bed were hanging down on, both, on all four sides. So I was hidden, as it were, because they, those, thing, those places were inspected every so often. So I lay there and uh, every so often the cloth was uh, uh, lifted and the bowl was <laughs> cold black with, well, with lukewarm black water, they called it coffee, was handed to me or some kind of a mixture of stuff. And so I ate. So I won't tell you how one's mind deteriorates. This happened once, it was lifted and picked out. And I saw a foot with black toes next to, very, very close to my bed, and a hand with a pair of pliers I don't know, do you remember the, the older folks here might know the pliers that, that cut like this? You know, not like this, but like this. He had pliers there. 
and he clipped off the toes, the black toes. And there was soup that was shoved down next to me. And it didn't bother me in the least. I just threw my mice, myself on the soup and had that soup. We were starved. We were hungry 24 hours a day. And this horrible sight didn't bother me. So let me say something else just as an analysis type of remark. We became dehumanized. I think that is the right term. We were no longer humans as we define a human being to be. I had forgotten my parents completely. I had forgotten my sister completely. Every moment was used to make myself invisible to the German guards. But let me add to that, that there was a positive aspect to that. And the positive aspect is that we didn't, pardon the expression, give a damn whether we stayed alive or not. And when we were beaten, and I was once beaten where people had to carry me out, and I was lying there for I don't know how long. Um, we, we, this means being inhuman, not feeling anything, not good, not bad. You just you become a machine that's beaten in order to perform. And if you don't, don't perform, well, you're being killed and you're, you're thrown into a ditch and that's it. So maybe that's good because I'm, I'm saying all this because I've been liberated. When I saw my father who survived uh, Auschwitz, Auschwitz number four, uh, the, the number camps that were part of Auschwitz were numbered. My father was not the same man whom I saw after his concentration camp experience. And I, re I to this day, I feel horrible about it. I, I feel guilty about this. Why should I be guilty? But I feel guilty because my relationship that was so good before the war was completely destroyed. And that's, I, I, I think my father's relationship to his wife persisted, I, I think so, because I, because I slept in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but what I, my sister no longer had that relationship with my father either. So we, we were no longer humans. And that is precisely what Hitler tried to do to us, to dehumanize, dehumanize us, to, to, to make a bunch of automatons out of us, to de deprive us of our humanity. And he succeeded. And let me say that after my liberation, it took a while, it took probably several months for me to regain my humanity. I got it back, uh, but uh, my father, I don't think got it back. I visited him 22 years after I left Czechoslovakia for America because the country had turned communist. And I was afraid to go back because I would left with bought passports and a bought visa. They weren't, as we say in, in, in our Jewish life, they weren't kosher. They weren't right, and I was afraid I'd be caught. So it took 22 years. It took Ruth was one of the children with whom we visited Czechoslovakia. Then. So let me get to the end of this. Seven camps, uh, 79 pounds human being. Uh, we were in this last camp, and uh, what happened? There was a road call, as every time. We went, stood there at attention. We did Mützen up, Mützen auf. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. This is torture. It's just meaningless. And uh, we waited, and we waited. And there were towers all around the periphery of the camp 
with machine guns up there. And usually there were SS people up there manning the machine guns. And I remember looking up there and there was nobody up there. The machine guns were there, but no soldiers. But you see, our mind had so deteriorated by that point that we could not put two and two together. We had heard the rumbling noises for several weeks before because the Russians were coming and there were, there were fightings, there were all kinds of battles. We couldn't figure it out. And then the, there were triple fence around the, these concentration camps. The two outer fence were probably 12 feet high, one with a space in between, a second one, and an electric fence that was low, a wire that strung. That was a high voltage wire. And there were people in our camps who could no longer stand it, who felt, let's just put an end to it, and sneaked out at night and touched those wires. And in the morning we saw them hanging on the wires. And it's just, it's, it's horrible. So, we waited. And then the triple gate fence opened and the German commander came in, an SS commander. All alone, there must have been a thousand, 800, I don't know how many people in that camp. I walked up to the Jewish commander and they had some kind of a conversation. Uh, one, one of them, the, the German, actually smiled. Then he turned around and walked out, walked out of the gates and as he made a left turn, I see that happening before me, he took a keychain from his belt and threw it into the camp over the fences. And he disappeared. And we still stood there, waiting. What were we waiting for? We were free. But we didn't understand it and we didn't believe it. And then we heard a funny noise coming, an engine noise. And here comes a tank. And the tank had a white star, five-pointed star on the side. There was a soldier in the, in the tower of the tank, drove into the fences, smashed the fence on one side, and kept on going, one single tank. And uh, we still stood there. I don't know how long <laughs> we stood there, but then the guy who stood next to me from Austria said to me, you know, uh, I think we're free, Jason Fry. And we left the group and we went to town, to Waldenburg, to the same street where we marched to work. And there was a truck standing there. And it was painted uh, like the army stuff is painted, green, brown, I don't know. And we climbed on the truck looking for something, probably food. And sure enough, there were shelves on the truck filled with cans, brown painted cans. And we produced a screwdriver from somewhere, opened these, bang, 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 pried open the, the top, and it was white stuff, but heavenly smell. And it was pork pork fat and so we went in with our hands stuffed ourselves with pork fat there was meat underneath and we emptied I don't know how many cans and then we saw a sack sitting in the trunk in the truck bed slid it open with sugar we got on our all fours ate sugar you know, we hadn't eaten this for years. And then everything went black. I have no idea what happened then. When I woke up, I was lying in a bed in a nice room. I thought I'd gone to heaven. But what I didn't see was the angels. Because my mom, uh, when I was a little boy, had me in a baby bed and on both sides the headboard had little angels with naked bottoms, <laughs> you, just floating around in the air there. So I grew up with that, the angels in heaven. So I'm in heaven. 
but I look for the angels, there were no angels. So I just lay there. And then the door opened, and the little woman, shorter than I, came in, uh, dressed in black, and she saw my eyes open. She came to my bed, sat down by the bed, and said, wir haben den Krieg verloren, es ist alles vorbei, wir sind jetzt frei. We are free. And I fell back and I kept on sleeping. And the second time I woke up, this other fellow, he was already open up, up, uh, up. So what do you do now? You, you see, th this, these are all insights that come to you under these horrible conditions. We had not made a decision in four, three, three and a half years. We couldn't because other people made the decisions for us. So we didn't know what to do with ourselves. Uh, we stayed with a lady. She cooked, I mean, pots of, of soup for us. And we ate and ate and slept and ate, so forth and so on. But we had these terrible blue, white striped pajamas on that were, they were, that was material that the, that the wind went through. It was, the weave was so, so weak, you know, so rare. So we decided we'll get rid of our clothing, we'll go into the city, we'll look whoever we're going to find, we're going to find our different clothes. And we did. And we went into basements. The, the city was absolutely empty. The Germans had left because the Russian soldiers were scary to them, and they should have been, because they didn't be behave very well. So we went to the basements, opened suitcases, we got out the, the variety of clothing, got rid of the old clothing, still didn't know what to do, so we went back to the damn camp. Nothing had changed in the camps. There were fires uh, burning here and there. People must have maybe caught a rabbit, or I don't know, or bread or toasted it. I have no idea. But we went back and didn't, and just stayed there. What do you do? And then women started coming to the camp, and they were in blue striped clothing, these pajamas that we had to wear. And I remember standing next to the fence and seeing three other women that had come uh, who stood together talking to each other. And I walked up to them and said, excuse me, I was very shy. I still am, by the way. But um, I was very shy. And I said, excuse me, but wherever you're coming from, did you by any chance run into a person by the name of Ziffer? And one woman said, Ziffer? There was one in my barrack. There was a woman. There were two women there and another woman whose name was Borger. Where? Uh, where she gave me a name of a women's concentration camp that wasn't very far from us. And so I made my first decision. I went down, I mean, from where I was that in Waldenburg, I went into the city and was somebody coming on a bicycle, it was a German. And I walked up to the, toward him, I said, stop get off the bike. That was the first decision I made. And we looked so horrible, they knew where we were coming from. And the guy did not argue, didn't say one word, he got off the bicycle, and I took the bicycle. And I bicycled. I mean, the, I, I won't know where it was, and somebody told me where it was. I come to a women's camp. I'm looking for somebody by the name of Ziffer. Oh yeah, sure, we know her. Annie Ziffer and her daughter Edith, over there in that barrack. Walk to the barrack, they weren't there because they were out, here's a concentration camp term, they were organizing food. That means stealing it or taking it or whatever. And they, the women were way ahead of the men. They prepared pretty good food. They invited me to eat. And I just sat there. The, the entrance is there, very close to the entrance. 
waited maybe 20 minutes. The door opens. My mother walks in. My sister walks in. My cousin walks in. And they look at me, and they smiled. They kept on going. And they, they, they had this, that bags that they carried, probably food, that organized food, walked to the corner of the, the room where I was and started unpacking. And I walked up to them, to my mom, and I said, I'm your son. <laughs> my voice is breaking at this point. But that's, that's okay. Because I, I, I cannot tell you, thank you, uh, what this was to me. I mean, it, it was an explosion of joy, of course. And my sister was there too. And so we were back together. My father wasn't there. So they had food, we ate. And again, we, we didn't know exactly know what to do. But then men were coming from other camps. At this point, there were people, you know, moving from one, looking for each other, looking for members of the families. And uh, there were two men that came, and we decided to trek uh, back home to Chesky Cheshin, and we did. And th that opens really a new chapter in, in our life. It was very difficult. The bridges were, b were blown up, um, and the Russian soldiers were roaming around, and they were very badly behaved. They, I hate to say this, but they raped some of the women they had liberated. And so the peasants that took us in and that fed us with milk and bread and gave us a place in their outbuildings s insisted that we do not walk in daytime. And then some of them had horses, pulled us for a certain distance uh, in, in the wagons. Uh, a lot of it we walked. We weren't all that far, probably in a modern car, uh, probably would take uh, maybe, I don't know, eight hours to get there. But walking is a different story. And uh, so we finally arrived at home. And uh, as we entered, my, my mom was a tough woman. And uh, I mean, I think clear to her death, just best cook, but also tough. And we walk into our town, and there's a lady that comes toward us, and she recognizes my mother and said, Mrs. Zippert, do you know that your husband is already here? Fantastic. So I was then delegated to go find my father. My father was in the apartment of the maid that had been a living maid uh, prior to the war in our apartment, whom both my sister and I loved almost as much as my mother. Her name was Malchi Kurianova, Hungarian woman. I went to her house. That's where my father was, was supposed to be. She, she embraced me, she was happy, and well, your dad is over there. And I walked into the room, my father was sitting in a corner of the room looking at the wall. And, uh, well, I introduced myself to him, but there was so little um, recognition, so, so little um, anything from him. You know, he, okay, he, or something like that. And I forced him then to follow me where my parents, where my mother was. And it took a long time for him to, uh, to regain his humanity. He was the most educated, most loving father. Gone. And that relationship, even though I stayed there, almost two years before I came to the United States, uh, never returned. I mean, we corresponded, but um, he was not the same person. And I could go on now to tell you how I come to, my, to America, but I'm not going to do that. But I think we can stop this, and if you have any questions, 
I will try to respond to it. Although I'll tell you right now, to some questions, I don't have an answer. No one has an answer. How people, highly cultured people, who produced a Goethe and a Beethoven, and some of the greatest uh, humanists and poem, poets and writers, and, and how they could sink to that kind of low level of, of humanity, I cannot understand, and I haven't got many answers. So we'll have to live with those questions. Maybe someday they will be answered. Uh, thank you for listening. And I'm going to stop here. And if you have any questions, any questions, I'll be glad to try, try to respond to. Pardon me? Do you have a number? I, I was, uh, yes. I <laughs> No, not tattoo. Because tattooing took place only in Auschwitz. My father had a number. And you see, after the war, I wanted to forget this whole damn time that I wasn't. So I don't know the number. All I know is that it began with an H, H dash something. I had the number 64,757, which was here on the back of my jacket. And so I lost my name. That's part of the, the lack of humanity. I became an object. And when you know what an object, this is an object. It belongs to you guys. But if I wanted to, I could, could go to a hardware store and smash this thing. Couldn't I? I could. Probably end up in jail. Uh, that, that's another story. But um, that is part of the humanity that we lost. We became objects and the superior people who, whose prisoners you are can do with you whatever they want to because they did it to 64,757, not to Walter Ziffer. Now people, let me say one more thing perhaps. People ask me how come you survived when six million people were murdered? And I don't have a clear answer, but I can say this. I spoke fluent German. And when a person came, an engineer, say in, 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 uh, um, uh, in the first camp in Sakharov, where we built the highway, gave me a, a rake and said, okay, do you see this area here? Can you rake it nicely, smoothly? I understood. I took the rake and <laughs> with my <laughs> exaggerated ethical mind <laughs> to do this right. I did a good job. And okay, that was the end of it. But there were mostly Polish Jewish people in those camps whose men spent most of the time, mind you, to this day, studying scriptures in Hebrew and in Aramaic. I'm not making fun of this. That's their way of life. I respect that. But you give them a rape, a rake. They have no idea what to do with it. And they don't learn mathematics in the school. And that, that's, to, to me, that's tragic. Some of the women very often work and support the family. But the men study in what they call the yeshiva and the study Torah and, and holy scriptures. Well, it's a different style of, of, of life. It's a different style of work. That's their style, not our style. Any questions? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. How long did it take you to get this uh, work in Africa? Was it over five years? Or I, I can't or quite hear. How long did it take you to look like a normal person? Oh, again? yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, that, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I can answer that. If my mom and dad were here, they could answer it, I'm sure. But you know, the, to me, okay, the most powerful thing you can do in a situation like this, the best results that you can, that you can get from what you are doing 
is loving the other person. To, to me, uh, love really conquers all. And um, unfortunately, when you're in a camp with the fellow other prisoners, you'd think that a relationship would form, a loving relationship, supporting relationships. And that's not always the case because evil and uh, pastor, what's, what's his name? Yeah, you'll agree with me. They, they is, I don't believe in a devil that'll walk in here with two horns, you know. But I believe in evil. Evil is a reality. And I think only love, properly applied, can heal that kind of illness, I would say. I don't know. It's not, it's not a sufficient answer to what you said. But my mother, my, fa my father loved me, of course, even after that whole experience. But he was not the kind of person who, who somehow conveyed that love as well as my mother did. So not only was she the best, the second best cook in the world, uh, she also knew how to, uh, how to love the other person, how to make the other person feel that love. And then what happens very often is that that person perhaps after a lengthy time responds with the same kind of stuff. And my mother could do it. I dream of my mother very often. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, were they anti-Semitic? Were they helpful? Were they just oblivious to you? Or what was their attitude towards the prisoners, especially some of them? They ignored us. They, t as I said, there were a good many cases of, of rape, where they raped uh, the very women whom they liberated. And uh, unfortunately, I. I I mean, I'm sure you listen to the evening news or daylight news. Uh, rape has become a weapon these days, unfortunately. It's unbelievable. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that people who were taught in a way to kill engage in. Um, I, I hope that uh, our armed forces, for instance, uh, having been educated in a different way than those Russians in those days uh, behave differently toward liberated people. Because we as American soldiers also liberate people. Um, the, the possibility of uh, military training I say the possibility. One possibility is to dehumanize people, who, to do things that normal people like you and I would never think of doing. It's, uh, I, I mean, I hate to say that. I only hope that our people are differently educated from the Russians. We found that most Russians that we experienced were from far east. Uh, from Vladivostok, from that area. That's the, the end of the Russian ex-empire uh, that goes up there. And um, they, well, to give you an example, when we tried, after we came back to our town, we tried to get back to our apartment, which was a beautiful apartment <laughs> that my mom, my mom polished our, the, her, the bedroom was made of exotic <laughs> African woods. It, it used to drive us crazy. And my father said, Honey, quit that. I mean, it's shining already, you know. Okay. Um, it was totally ruined, that apartment. I mean, totally. They had taken leather furniture and bayoneted it. But what was even worse, we went into the toilet 
and they had used the bathtub as a toilet. Where did these people come from? Okay. So um, this, uh, we couldn't stay there. This is why the government then gave us this little apartment where we stuck together. Uh, we were five people. Uh, the, uh, another thing, <laughs> they didn't know what a watch was. They, they, they did see alarm clocks in apartments where the Germans had left or were expulsed by the Czechs, where the Russians came in, and they took alarm clocks and put string around them and used them on their wrists. You know, I've never been in those areas, and what I see on television is totally different. I mean, it, it, these are lovely people that are shown, but, but uh, I, I don't know, it's just a totally cultural, huge cultural difference. I don't know that this answers your question, but uh, if, if you liberate people and then rape them, that's, that's a s pretty bad, I'd say. Yes. about Jesus? Okay, well, to what you said before, I have to bring this up to date. Okay. I was informed by telephone, uh, when, Gail, when was that, last week? Oh, you're here. <laughs> that I'm about to get a, uh, an honor, a honorable doctorate from the university here. Uh, I have a doctorate myself, an earned doctorate, but that one is, uh, Honorable one. Okay. So um, your question was what I. I, I know you've stepped away from Christianity and even Judaism, yeah, yeah. But, but having done that for Yeah, so about long, Jesus. Yes. What, what, is your, what is your thoughts on him? Okay. Among uh, Jews, let me speak a bit generally first. Mm -hmm. There are also denominations, just as in Christianity. And so the. the three sort of basic denominations, uh, the Orthodox people, uh, who, who are his, the children and the men very often just spend most of the time studying in, in a yeshiva. Yeshiva comes from a Hebrew word yashav, to sit. They sit, okay, and they study uh, Hebrew of, and Aramaic. And uh, if you were to no, okay, I will go somewhere else. And then there's a conservative movement that Gail and I uh, used to belong to and still belong to, actually Beth, uh, the con congregation Beth Israel in Asheville. And uh, I was very active there for, for a long, long time. Um, I, uh, in fact, part of the congregation at one point wanted to make me, make me their rabbi. And uh, it didn't work out. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, pastors ha and the rabbis have very similar jobs. Some are loved and some are hated, <laughs> and some are appreciated and some aren't, etc., etc. Jesus is the most important person that Judaism produced. Okay? Uh, if you understand what I mean, in every way. And uh, while I respect the whole rabbinic establishment, the remarkable p people among our rabbis. There's no question about that. Um, many um, Orthodox Jewish people really, as I, I think suggested already, have not, invo have not evolved culturally. I mean, they think that all life depends and interacts with the scriptures, which is not exactly true in my opinion. Uh, uh, I admire Jesus. 
And I tell you who I admire most. When you read the, the Old Testament, and Judaism, of course, is not limited to the Old Testament. There's a post-rabbinic, huge, huge literature that is worth studying, which I've partially studied. No one in the world has studied it all. Some of it has never been translated. I mean, I, I can handle Hebrew pretty well, but uh, I, I wouldn't say I, I know the Torah. It's called the Torah, which Torah means learning, basically, learning, teaching, that type of thing. But Jesus went out to cure people, lepers, for instance. And here is a story I could tell you about lepers with my mom, and it tells you something about my mom. Uh, rabbis in those days didn't do that. In fact, you were, there's impurity there, okay? And part of the scriptures, and I think the New Testament, in my limited um, opinion, has inherited part of this, uh, particularly among people who are very, very uh, literal in their understanding of the scriptures. If you're sick, you're sick because you've sinned. That, that is the Hebrew, the, 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 the Torah approach, believe it or not, it is. Um, now we know better than that, okay? Uh, so, the, the study of Torah and the, the, the many contradictions that you find there, plus, um, how shall I say this? Um, alienated me from, from, the, from the scriptures. In, in fact, I'm, there's a congregation in a Asheville that is a, is a Jewish congregation, but they do not believe in a God, okay? And uh, I mean, they would agree with me what I just said. I'm supposed to give a lecture there uh, in May, I think. So, what shall I say? I, I see Jewish people just like anybody else. I do not believe in uh, there being a special people. They, they're humans like you and I. We, if, if you ask me, do I live differently from my neighbors? And Jewish ethics, there is such a field you can feel, you can study. But to me, that ethics was taken over by Jesus anyway. And Christians have the same ethics I have. And if you were to look into the homes of my, my neighbors and into my home, you'd see very little difference there. And to, to me, a religion, and you may not agree with this, that's okay, because I respect what you believe. Uh, I respect it, I do not share it. Um, to, to me, a religion is primarily important in terms of ethics. Do you what? Was he the Messiah? That whole messianic teaching is a problem for me. I think the messiahship has been postponed on and on and on. Uh, Jesus has not returned um, for, for the second coming, as we call it, right? And in Judaism, uh, in my uh, part of Judaism, as well as in the what we call the reform and the reconstructionist, the four of those. Uh, messianism is not particularly important. What is important, I think, for all of us, for all of Jewish people, is ethics. And I'm part of that. And that's a vast area, of course. How do you treat your fellow human beings? We don't. Um, when you look at the Old Testament, how much is there about an afterlife? Practically nothing. And so uh, people who believe otherwise, I fully respect. If they live a decent life, <laughs> they are my brothers and my sisters. And uh, let me tell you a story now, a, a little something that happened to me. Uh, my, my major professor in seminary 
uh, was a man by the name of Herbert Gordon May. He's a Christian person, and uh, he was the professor of the Graduate School of Theology of Oberlin College. I studied there for four years, got two master's degrees there. Uh, Herbert uh, May uh, invited me to travel with him uh, on various occasions, in the Middle East, for instance. He, he, he was like a father to me, and I worked with him. I was a teaching assistant in his classes, in Hebrew classes, etc., etc. And at one point, there was an, a global meeting of a, uh, of a uh, organization called the International Organization for the Study of the Old Testament. Uh, and that place took, that, that, that meeting of scholars, basically, took place in Rome. And so he invited me to to join him, in, to travel with him to Rome, and we were in Rome at the Vatican. And um, it was Augustine Cardinal Bea, who was the organizer of this meeting, and an Old Testament scholar, Roman Catholic priest, Cardinal. And so we went to the Vatican, and uh, I, I was in my fourth year of studies, with Herb May. <laughs> he always called me, called me Herb. I couldn't do it, I always say Dr. May. <laughs> so, so we went to the Vatican and uh, Augustine Cardinal Bea was our host and Dr. May introduced me to him. He knew him from my previous meetings. Uh, this is a young man who is very much interested in Jewish Christian dialogue, which is true but took on a different dimension after this meeting. So Cardinal Bea took me by my shoulders, <laughs> said, young man, let's get away from here. There was a lot of chatting going on among the scholars. You know. So he took me into a corner there in a big hall, or champagne glasses, you know, and <laughs> cookies. And he said, young man, you, I understand you understand, yeah, I understand you're interested in Jewish Christian dialogue. I said, yes, sir. I was so intimidated, you can't imagine. He said, well, I want to tell you something. You, you, you may find this interesting. Jewish Christian dialogue will not success, succeed until Christians dig down to the bedrock of the faith and until Jews dig down to the bedrock of their faith when they do that, they will find themselves standing on the same rock and they'll find themselves to be brothers and sisters. Then he let me go. And then I got a champagne glass and drank it. <laughs> but that changed everything for me. And I've been doing this the rest of my life. I've tried to interpret Christianity to Judaism and I was a pastor for 25, 22 years. And Christians becoming acquainted. Judaism, Jewish, uh, Jews um, being informed about interesting things in Christianity. And I thoroughly believe that we are brothers and sisters. Hello. Yes. Absolutely. The answer will not be the next day, but if you <laughs> give me a week, and if you don't write all at the same time, <laughs> it'll take a little longer. But Cardinal Bea changed, did something to me with that simple answer. And by the way, there's one thing I could ask you now in response to the story. When he said, dig down to the bedrock of your faith, what is that bedrock? What does it mean? You see, I should have asked him. I was so intimidated. I was a student in graduate school, 
And he is the cardinal, my gosh, who talks to me. And, uh, but uh, I personally think it's ethics. But I may be wrong. I've been wrong before. <laughs> so uh, am, I, am I making myself clear? So Jesus is very important in my life, absolutely. And uh, the 22 years that I, that I was a pastor, uh, I was a pastor in Washington, D.C., in, Be in Belgium, in Brussels, for expatriates, Americans, and, and other, all kind of nationalities. And uh, in, in France, uh, and um, I was never once during my ministry, accused of questions about my ministry, about the quality of my ministry. Uh, it's, um, I, I, I respect all faiths. I mean, you know. Okay, any other questions? If not, if not I'm liberated. We have refreshments and drinks okay. and cookies. Uh, so that we even have a table for you to, to so if people want to come and approach Wonderful. and talk, we'd Thank love you. to give them that opportunity. Um, but we are we are humbled to have you come and share your experience with us, your insight.